I have kind of based this talk around a mixed level um, of knowledge, not really knowing what everybody's familiar with and what everybody uses in practice. So apologies to those of you that this, some of this may be a little bit basic. Um, and then if not, at least there's something you can always take home. And for those that maybe aren't used to using multi-parameter monitors and things, um, then hopefully you will pick up something from here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about multi-parameter monitors. Um, how many of you are using them in practice? Do any of you use them in practice? Whoa, loads of hands, brilliant, okay. So hopefully I'm not gonna be telling you everything that you already know. Um, so obviously then you'll be aware that these are really helpful pieces of a kit. Um, they give us a whole range of information all on one single screen. Now that's fantastic because you've got a beautiful pretty picture to look at there which an old intern that I used to work with was super happy about because his parameters look beautiful. Um, that's great as long as you understand what all those wiggles and dots and lines are actually telling you. So what my aim is to do is just pick out a couple of key areas which I think are the most important ones um, and just give you a little bit of a background information and see if we all understand how actually this, this machine is actually giving us this information and then what the, how we can then use that to monitor, help monitor our patients a bit better. So again, that was just another little picture of a, of a multi-parameter monitor. So you can see there, I've got a little video of it sort of running there. Would everybody be familiar with all of the parameters on there? Yeah? Yeah? Um, are you even using this red one? Arterial. Yeah, so yeah, I would be super chuffed if you are, but then in, depending on where you're from, if you're from referral, then I would expect you are, but if you're in general practice, then probably wouldn't expect you to be using that. Um, but yeah, so it's, they're, they're, they're super helpful. We get all sorts of information. So we've got our heart rate, we've got our, if we've got the luxury of arterial blood pressure, we've got arterial blood pressure monitoring, which is our gold standard um, of blood pressure monitoring with anesthesia. We've got our pulse oximetry. Down the bottom there, we've got capnography. To the side on the left, well, my left, sorry, my, your, um, we've got spirometry, which again gives us a bit of information on, on the patient's breathing and lung capacities and things. And then down the bottom, we've got all of our basic parameters, so our NIPB, our temperature, respiratory gases, etc. I'm terrible. I tend to go off paste if I haven't got presenter view in front of me. So as you can see there, these are just some of the parameters <laughs> that we discussed. So what I'm going to focus on mainly is pulse oximetry and capnography. So you may all just think, oh, yawn, we all know, we all use that, then that's fine. But what I kind of want to talk about is a little bit um, how maybe our anaesthetics um, can affect how the machines work. Because generally things tend to get a bad press, especially pulse oxes. Um, they get a little bit of bad press because they're a bit temperamental. But the reason why that is because we're actually doing something that um, disrupts how that piece of equipment does its job. So we're causing it to work harder or maybe become a little bit temperamental. So we all know that it's a um, non-invasive way to monitor the um, blood oxygen saturation of blood. Um, we use it to... Um, do that in a non-invasive way. So our pulse oxes then consist of a few pieces of equipment. Um, we have our probes. We have a little chip inside that probe, um, which is able to do some jiggery pokery uh, um, and give us some information on, on what's happening when the infrared light is absorbed through a mucous membrane. So as you can see here, We've got our probe. On here is our little red light chip. So do we all know what that little red light chip is? Yeah, we need that for the pulse ox to be working. On here, we get our pulse oximeter trace here. So we've got the number. Are we used to using this part? Yeah, what's that part? Pleth, yeah, brilliant. Why is that important? Fab. And how can I see whether that's a true reading by looking at that? Don't worry if not, it's just, um, it's super cool because people don't usually interact and I'm excited that you guys are using these, so. Uh, it has to follow a certain trace, but it can't be small and narrow, it's got to be tall and 
tall and even, and in line with anything else on that monitor? Somebody said it, heart rate, pulse rate. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous. Yeah, so we know that with every beat that the heart is generating, as you can see on the top there, ECG just gives us information about heart rate. For every beat that's being generated at the heart, we know that blood is actually getting pumped out to the circulation and we're actually oxygenating well because we tend to put pulse oxes on tongues, toes, um, man and lady parts sometimes if accessibility is what is um, a bit limited. Um, and we can tell then that if we've got that, come, if we've got a lovely strong pulse pleth, then we know that actually we've got an accurate reading. So I can trust that. If you don't have a nice pulse pleth to go with it, then sometimes your, your, your actual number that you're getting generated, you're a bit dubious as to whether you actually, actually trust it. Um, and this slide down here is actually super interesting. I put that down there. Does anybody find that slide at the bottom there a bit scary, that screen? Please say yes. <laughs> so yeah, that was actually taken um, in, in an interventional cardiology procedure. So where we were, at, we were actually um, disrupting um, cardiac output intentionally through trying to repair something. Um, but you can see here now that the EC tree trace has literally gone a bit awful. Um, we've got lots of escapes and things going on down here. So we've got our normal, beautiful complex, and then we've got our expates down here. Down on this side here, my arterial blood pressure, you can actually see here, I've got no pulses coming out here. So I know that circulation is not great. That then correlates down with my um, pulse pleth. It hasn't been picked up too much on the capnography at that point, but you, the next run of reading it would have been seen. So you can actually really see how when your equipment's working correctly and you understand what's happening and what you're doing, um, how it can be useful to you. I've done it again. <laughs> this is my problem when I don't have present of you. So this is just, again, explaining what, what I've just said. I just got a little bit carried away with the slides. Um, so you can see here now, this is a beautiful example of a nice pulse ox trace, a nice ECG. Everything's working correctly. I'm going to trust that. Because I know people say you shouldn't trust in your machines, but I, I know that that machine's working well and it's telling me information. So I use all my other sensors alongside it to, 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 to run with that. So normal SpO2 values then, we won't go too much on these because hopefully we are all aware of what our normal um, SpO2 values. What I do want to focus on um, is when we have an SpO2 value of less than 90% because these are the points in which that's the number that we want to have in our head because we need to know, we need to be aware and we need to be think making some decisions about what we're doing and looking at, and looking at how things are going. So uh, this moves on to why we are looking at um, the pulse oximetry rate of, uh, well, a pulse oximetry reading of 90%. This slide is quite heavy. Don't worry too much. The main, um, the main take home point is really is the, for the partial peripheral arterial oxygen that the patients are breathing. So a normal patient um, breathing 100% oxygen will have a PaO2 of between four and 500. Um, you, the point of the 90% value on the SpO2 probe becomes when you look at the um, look at it within look at it when thinking of the oxygen disassociation curve. Are people aware of what this is? It's probably something that you got taught at school, and then quickly forgot about it because it would have been something that seemed quite heavy to take on. Um, but basically, when we're looking at um, monitoring patients, if we don't have the luxury of having arterial access, you can kind of estimate the PA2 by um, subtracting 30 from the SpO2. And we know that PA2 is 10 time, uh, five times the volume. So when we are um, monitoring patients when we have them on 100% oxygen, there is a linear relationship between the two, between 70 and 90%. So this makes it look a little bit easier. The main thing I want you to take home is basically, when a SpO2 is 90%, you can see here now that the little skiing man, he's kind of taking a drop down quite quickly here. So we can see here 100% oxygen, we're trundling along quite happily, our SpO2s 
95, 100%. As soon as we start to get to this peak of the slope here, it basically means that our PA2, PAO2 is starting to fall quite quickly. Um, and that, can, that is, can be an emergency situation. It's moving generous, dangerously fast. If we're confident that all of our monitoring is working correctly, then your patients are really at risk of becoming really hypoxemic. So what you want to be knowing is understanding that your equipment's working properly, you're aware of what you're doing to that patient whilst he's under anaesthetic, um, and then you know how to act upon or, or move forward. Is that okay? Was that explained all right? So common misperceptions then of pulse oximetry, we probably all heard them before. They either don't work, they're rubbish, they're lying, they still work on dead patients, so what's the point? Um, generally, they, all of which really are not true. They, they're not lying. Yes, they do work on, on dead patients, um, but there's a lot of reasons as to why they are struggling to work. And this is why I kind of have the back of a pulse ox sometimes, because people just dismiss them as it's rubbish, don't like it, not going to use it, don't trust it. Um, but the main reasons that we are um, making the job difficult for that pulse ox is vasoconstriction. So if you think we are placing that pulse ox clip on a tongue, on a toe, on a willy, on a foo, these areas are really at the periphery. And if we have used lots of drugs that cause vasoconstriction, if we're naturally vasoconstricting the patient by making them cold, if they're shocked, um, all of these sort of things, the patients just become massively vasoconstricted. And then the pulse ox is like, well, I don't know what to do. Like, I've got no blood running through me because pulse ox are on the capillaries. And in these situations, obviously, you're going to the, they're going to the core. Um, other things, um, the thickness of the tissue, because we're, they work on pressure and temperature and whatnot. Any movement shaking if your patients are really cold. Um, hopefully, they don't get that cold that they're shaking under anaesthetic. Um, but all of these sort of things, if we're using them in a recovery situation, um, then, yeah, all of these sort of things affect on how that poor little probe is trying to work, and we just merrily tell it that it's rubbish. Um, pigmentation is another thing, which is another pain in the bottom, which is why, as much as I've mentioned about putting it on genitalia, it, I'm not weird, I do, it's not, but it's generally a less pigmentated area. Um, and when we're doing anaesthesia, we don't often have the head. We no normally have the back end. So those are the bits that are there. So bearing in mind what I've just said there, this um, pulse ox was not working. And this was a case where um, the nurse was a bit of an older generation, a bit more, as much as I'm old, but older than me, um, a bit more dismissive of these, these pieces of equipment and just generally dismiss the fact that the pulse ox wasn't working because she was telling me, oh, no, it's crap, please, it's not. I'm like, well, you know. And then on closer inspection, when you actually look at what's going on, can anybody see there? Tube tied in. Tube tied in, yeah. What twat tied that tube in? <laughs> me. <laughs> and so, obviously, I was super embarrassed and was like, oh, shit, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. But my key point is that nurse was a nurse who was pretty experienced. She was an older nurse, she'd been there forever, and she was just dismissing it. And that's what really got me to be like, no, 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 no. We need to actually look at the bigger picture and look at what's going on. And the pulse ox was not working because I tied the tube in. So obviously we've got loss of blood flow to the tongue. And if that had just been left, who knows? The patient was having a, um, a VBO, so we wouldn't have had the head access during surgery. So, yeah, you just don't know. So, yeah, tongue was tied in, starts to get a little blue tinge. We've got loss of blood flow. SpO2, yeah, the SpO2 was 89% with a dodgy raid form. So you can see there now, nice big fat tongue. <laughs> Lovely and pink, nice and warm, and our SpO2 is working. What about this one? It's not a great picture because there's light shining on it, which is a clue there. But what about that one? Would, how would you feel about that pulse ox reading if that was your anaesthetic? Yeah, fabulous. Yeah. So the light is obviously focusing on, well, not quite there, but we'll be focusing on the patient's eye because that patient was having a nucleation. 
And you can look at that monitor and say, well, actually, it's OK. I've got a bit of a pulse player. I mean, it's not a nice, beautiful, strong mountainous one with peaks, but I've got a number that I like, 98%, like that number. I've got a trace, like that. Patient's a bit tachycardic, but so is that. But there's a little question mark there. I don't actually know if this is a thousand percent true, so please don't quote me on it. But working with, um, I've worked with a lot of anaesthetists over the past, and we've kind of come to the rough conclusion that if there's a little question mark there, it usually means, well, I'm going to give you that number, but I'm not really going to like hold myself to it. So you know, use it at your discretion, and that was just something that I picked up. But I think the key point is there: you're looking at the bigger picture. You're not just focusing on numbers that you like because you can see them you're actually seeing that, oh, actually, yeah, there is something affecting, affecting that there. The other problem that would have become a row would have arisen as well. Um, he's having an enucleation. The ophthalmologist is going to have their hands there. So there's no point in having it on the tongue anyway. Hence why you go round to the other end of the patient. So when is it working then? We want to know that we've got a nice, lovely waveform. The waveform is responding with our QRS, um, is in, sorry, in correspondence with our QRS complex on our ECG. Um, we've got a nice strong amplitude or pulse peaks. Um, there's absolutely no interference. Um, and that we, it, it, your, your pulse pleth should roughly be in line with the ECG. It won't be accurate within your ECG trace. It won't be. Um, dead on because obviously your ECG is your heart and then your pulse is your pulse but it should be as near as damn it in line um, something where a pulse ox wouldn't be very helpful to you um, would be in like a resus situation because there's a bit of a delay on them so I'm purely talking on anaesthesia side so yeah there we go you can see there now that it looks pretty beautiful there. I've got my top ECG at the top, heart rate's 123. My pulse rate is 122, so that's pretty much bang on. My QRSs are pretty much in line with my ECG. Doesn't look as pretty, but that's the real life of what we're gonna be looking at. Um, and yeah, everything is all about similar. So I think my take home summary on this is, is basically, understanding how that pulse oximeter is working you need to understand that that little red light is doing quite a lot <laughs> um, and also the same with the little red trip the, the little um, chip inside there so as much as we bash them about they get damaged or you sort of see the little red light and it's flashing you kind of get a little bit complacent of all of the technical gubbins that's going on in there so before we dismiss it we kind of want to know that we are aware of the limitations um, and be aware of what we're doing to our patients to affect how that's doing its job okay so co2 then because these are my two sort of favorite areas really on the multi-parameter monitor. So we know that CO2 is a um, byproduct of, of respiration. We know that we need a well-functioning um, respiratory system or well-functioning lungs um, and well-functioning output for CO2 to be able to be released. So we need to know that that, that, that CO2 is being delivered correctly or efficiently to the lungs and then can be expired out during, during respiration. So I think our, our point really um, with it is if we know that we've got a nice CO2, we know we've got good cardiac output, we know that the body systems are working nicely and we know that the patient is coping well under anaesthetic. So what is capnography then? So capnography is um, the measurement of CO2 in, in expired breaths. Um, it's really helpful for us because it's non-invasive and we can get a lot of information in a non-invasive way, which means so we're not having to um, you know, um, do arterial sticks. We're not having to place arterial catheters because again, this little piece of tech is giving us a whole heap of information. So we've got a couple of um, different versions of it, all of which generally give us the same thing. So we get a waveform, 
which is our little elephants chasing elephants, um, and we get a number. All of these are giving us the information on circulation. So another helpful tip at the bottom again, it gives us some information of leaks, blockages, disconnections um, under anaesthesia, because especially for us in a referral setting, we've got a lot of kit and caboodle covering our patients and they can easily get knocked off. We know sometimes if we do have a sudden drop in CO2 or a sudden no CO2, end tidal CO2, it's unlikely that that patient's going to be arresting otherwise because we would have seen other things happening going on. Usually it means something's become disconnected. And then as the person goes, who hey, do we smell gas? I'm like, oh yes, my, my capnograph's fallen off. <clears throat> so we have two different measurement devices. We've got mainstream and side stream. What are you all using? Yeah, fab. I've never used mainstream before. It's always been side stream. But mainstream is just a little... Um, connector um, that sits directly um, directly to the ET tube and it, it measures that part of the breath there. So these are some examples of um, mainstream ones and you can see that by the dog's nose. He's got the little red doodah there. Unfortunately, they're, they're not my pictures. I apologise. I did steal those. So side stream, this is what we're going to be using on our monitors. Um, so this has a little connector. So you've got your little clear line that goes missing, gets soggy, gets lost. Never got enough of them in the building, even though you've got 15,000 somewhere in a cupboard. Um, and what that little connector does is um, attaches to the breathing system, usually on the little elbow. Yeah, or you've got a special little connector that you do. And what that does, it has a vacuum and it's drawing a little sample of gas um, that that patient is expiring, whizzing it up into the um, into the defend into the machine, doing its jiggery pokey magic machine things, and then giving us all of this wonderful information. It is out of sync, obviously, because there's a delay, um, but still, we like it. So you can see there, I've got my little connector on the HME there. Goes up to the little little defend in the corner here. And then we get our display reading there, which is lovely. So do we understand the display waveform? Yeah, we know what's happening at each part. Yeah, go quiet now. <laughs> so basically what's happening? So we have this beautiful little curve that when I was at school, I got taught was like elephants chasing, following elephants, which I don't know if they still do, but I liked it and it stuck with me. So what we're looking at is the key different parts. So you've got your baseline at the bottom um, between A and B. Um, you have your inspiratory baseline. So if we remember, we're looking at end tidal CO2. This took my little brain a lot to get the hang of when I was at school because I, it just blew my mind because everything else was the opposite way. But you've got your inspiratory baseline and then we've got between B and C, which is the um, expiratory upsoak, the plateau. So the plateau at the top is literally where we're getting the last little bits um, of gaseous exchange, the last little bits of things working in the alveoli, all the way down to D, um, which gives us our end tidal value, which is the number that we're looking at. And then we've got the downstroke, um, which is, again, the, just the part of inspiration again. So what the number we're looking at is, is at the D point. So capnography and circulation, then I did sort of touch on it in the very beginning, but we know that we need a functioning circulatory system um, in order for CO2 to be eliminated from the body. Any reduction in entitled CO2 shows us that there's an indication of a fall in cardiac output. And obviously that's bad and we don't need, we, we want to do something about that. We need to act um, and determine what's going on. Where the capnograph comes into shine over the pulse ox in, an, uh, in a rest uh, situation would be, obviously, if you've got CO2, you've got output, you've got an alive patient. Amazing. So we're going to have a look at some abnormal traces because I've literally got five minutes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is very textbook-like. I'm sorry about that. There's a really embarrassing slide coming up, which is where I try to draw some of the really bad, um, <laughs> some of the things that you see. Um, but are we familiar with what's disrupting or what different traces look like on a, on a capnograph? I've got some pictures. Those are crap. I'm sorry about that. But I, I was trying to draw them because you see them and sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't. Um, but the ten, we tend to see rebreathing. Um, we tend to see the Curie clefts, um, obviously cease in respiration, hypoventilation, um, suddenly sort of dipping if you've got a, a reduction in cardiac output. But what we want to be looking at is just seeing some types of abnormal ones and what do we need to worry about or what do we need to do? So a shark fin one was again, one of those words that used to get flown about and you're like, oh, shark fin, oh, that's how I mean, it sounds. Um, a, a shark fin trace on your capnograph will indicate that there's some kind of problem with your respiratory system and what you tend to get is a spike. You don't tend to get your nice curve. Um, so in some of these cases, the patients will have a known um, respiratory problem. So you're kind of expecting that. Um, some of them not so much. They may have aspirated something and we may have a bit of bronchospasm. So we need to be thinking and looking about that and you know, highlighting it to your vets, highlighting it to your anaesthetist if you're lucky enough to have them um, because there's something going on that is, is, is beyond the scope of us. <laughs> um, no trace, apnea disconnection, extubation. Um, I think we tend to always go for the first one. Oh, it's not breathing, not breathing, not breathing. Um, but we've all fallen for it. I've fallen for it. And you're like, oh, oh my God, actually, it's not connected. Or even more embarrassingly, they've extubated. So again, in our setting, <laughs> small ones um, being positioned for things like ophthalmology, um, some of the weird and wonderful neuro positions, if you're bending their heads up into all sorts of weird ways, if they are really diggy, it's, it's quite easy to pop the tube out. Or if you're inducing them, you know you're not in the right place. Oh, sorry, okay, don't, don't want to go back to my rubbish drawings. Um, a high end tidal CO2, most likely um, hypoventilation, expired um, soda lime. Um, this one to the, my left again, uh, my right this time, sorry. Um, our Curie clefts um, or our patients fighting the ventilator. I, think, I actually think that's the wrong way around. Hyperventilation, I'm sure we all see that quite a lot. So we tend to get the really short, <laughs> sharp, panty ones, um, a really low end tidal, usually 20s. Um, that's frustrating sometimes, and that's when we're lucky. We can pop them onto the ventilator or give them some other drugs to try and settle that. Um, cardiac oscillations, have people heard of these ones? Yeah, no, that's great. Just because when I was in my previous job um, and doing a lot of teaching and training people with anesthesia, it was one that everybody was always really surprised at, so they haven't, and haven't heard of, but it's great to see that, you know, even in the last just three years, people are sort of getting more into using these things and seeing these, but cardiac oscillations are just where, um, the, where the part is beating, the gas is moving slightly in the tube, so you're getting your little, your little dutties on the inspiratory. And then I've got an example of disconnecting there. Um, so you can see on that one slowly, you've got your first initial lovely trace and then it started to drop off because again, the delay. Um, cuff leak, it's another common one that we tend to see. If you pop a little bit more air in the cuff or even if you squeeze your little um, cuff a teeny bit, you will sometimes see that that, that little notch there disappears. Um, so you know you've got a cuff leak going on there. <coughs> And again, a bit more on hyperventilation, a bit more on hypoventilation. So the hypoventilation one isn't so severe. Um, but what you want to be aware of, depending on how long you're going to have these patients under anaesthetic for, so a lot of our anaesthetics can be quite long. If you've got that at the beginning, you need to be looking, is my patient a bit deep? Is, you know, is, is, am I doing something a bit wrong? Do I need to be tweaking things? Again, on the, on the other side, my patient's light, why is my patient light? I'm only clipping, you know, if, if this is how he's reacting during clipping, how is he gonna be for surgery? 
a bit more of those ones. The little respiratory, this is another quite interesting one. So that one, you can see the cardiac oscillations really nicely. And then this one, an example of respiratory disease. That was a really nice one to get because even my anaesthetist was quite happy with that one because again, you never managed to capture these things. Um, and we knew that that patient did have, um, did have some respiratory issues. So we were expecting problems and we were expecting things to look a bit strange. So it was nice to actually capture it and, and, and see what's going on. So then in summary then, the main point, capnography is looking at end tidal. So it's the end of respiration. We're looking um, at expiration, not inspiration. We want our CO2 to be between 35 and 45 millimeters mercury. We've got CO2, we've got an alive patient. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can all identify a normal capnograph waveform from an abnormal one.